So thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Sailesh Rao, and I'm going to talk to you about Kargon Dharma. That's the title of the book I wrote three years ago, and I'm writing an update on that book now. So I'm going to talk about the latest version of Kargon Dharma. So first of all, what is Dharma? Dharma is a Sanskrit word that really doesn't have an English translation. There is no real equivalent translation. The best you can do is to approximate it and say it means right conduct, right action. And it's right action or right conduct in harmony with life, harmony with nature. So carbon dharma is what is what is our dharma as a species? as far as what's going on in the environment is concerned. Okay. I'll tell you a story of, uh, that happened to me five years ago. So five years ago I was in this sanctuary in uh, the southern part of India in a state called Karnataka. So this is, this is uh, in between three national forests. So there is a valley. And that valley is full of private land and it's full of coffee plantations. So in 1990, uh, a couple from New Jersey went to that valley and they bought a coffee plantation of 60 acres. So uh, this is Pamela and Anil Malhotra. Pamela was born in New Jersey, she was raised in New Jersey and so she made this transition. They went, she went to India. Her husband was Indian. And they said, they closed their Indian restaurant and went to, New Jersey, uh, to India and said, let's do something about the wildlife that disappeared. And they bought 60 acres of a coffee plantation and just let it go. And in 20 years, it became such a lush green forest. And over, over a span of 20 years, they bought neighboring coffee plantations. And now they have about 300 acres in the sanctuary. But if you go in that sanctuary, you begin to see what the forest really is like. It's thick green trees throughout. And the underbrush is so thick that you cannot walk through it. No animal can go through that. It's only snakes that can go through that. So the only pathways in the forest were created by elephants. So this coffee plantation became a forest because elephants would go and eat jackfruits from the national forest and come to their coffee plantation and poop. And along with the seeds of jackfruits, I don't know if you've ever seen jackfruits, they're mm. huge. So an elephant can take a jackfruit from a tree and stick it in his mouth and eat it. And so along with the seeds comes the fertilizer. So jackfruit trees come up. So pretty soon, the animals all began to realize that this sanctuary was safe. But that's all Pam and Anil did. They tore down all the fences, let the animals come in, and then they patrolled their land to make sure that no poachers can come inside. And the forest came up. And at night, the sounds from the forest filled every spectrum of your, or your auditory spectrum. You know? so, every octet of your auditory spectrum. So pretty much, you cannot make out any gap. It's like a continuous sound. And it's beautiful. It was perfect. So you can feel the perfection. And I sat there and I wondered, you know, I was born just 200 miles away from the same forest. I was also born in the same forest. So why is it that Pam and Anil had to make sure that no human beings could ever come inside the forest in order for the forest to come back up? Why is it that I don't belong in this forest? And all these animals do. So there is something wrong with the story. If you look at what's happened to the world over the past 40 years, say, from, from 1970 to 2010, 52% of all vertebrates got destroyed. 
in the wire. So right now, uh, according to Vaclav Smil, the total biomass of wild animals in the world, land animals, is uh, 10 million tons. This is what it is. And the total mass of human beings is 100 million tons. So we are 10 times as much. And the total mass of our livestock is 300 million tons. So in 40 years, 52% of wildlife were destroyed. And at the same time, in 40 years, our human population doubled. Human population doubled. But along with that, we, we doubled our consumption of milk. We tripled our consumption of meat. We quadrupled our consumption of eggs. And we're eating eight times as many chickens as we used to. So our consumption increased much faster than our population. So you think about it and you say, you know, why is it that we, we don't fit in? Why is, why is it that we don't know how to live in this forest? Whereas the elephant, everything the elephant does helps the forest come back. The elephant eats fruits and poops seeds. And the trees, new trees come up. The elephant breaks branches of a tree and eats the leaves, throws the wood around, and that becomes home for termites. And you know, they, uh, insects eat that. And in the process, the elephant creates openings for sunlight to stream down and nourish the underbrush. So everything the elephant did seemed to have something beneficial for the forest. And in contrast, we had to just stay away from the forest. So that's the story we have been told. That's what I realized. I realized at that point that this is a story that we have been told, that we don't belong. What if this is not true? What if we do belong exactly as we are? Because you know, there are really four uh, storylines you can talk about. So the main storyline that the environmentalists always tell us is that everything is a mess and everything must change. <coughs> and when you tell people everything is a mess, some of them created the mess. So they get defensive. They don't want to change. So it's a, it's a very hard storyline to get people to change. <coughs> so the second storyline is, you know, everything is perfect and nothing needs to change. And we also hear that storyline. But what that usually ends up is that they're all going to go away, right? Except for the chosen few. Who will stay behind and who will go to heaven and the rest of us are going to languish in hell. So it's again a story. And if we believe that story, we will act according to that story. So the third storyline, which is uh, something that George Carlin says, which is uh, uh, everything is a mess and nothing will change. And again, this, the, the end line there is that we're all going to go away. He said, pack your stuff, folks. You're not even going to leave a trace. So you're going to disappear. And again, it is very pessimistic as a storyline. Right? It makes us feel like we don't belong. So the fourth storyline is to say everything is perfect and everything will change. So it's fine. What we have done is fine. You know, we, are, we do belong exactly as we are. But we have to be prepared that everything is going to change because that's the signal that the earth is sending us now. The Dharma is really an interaction between the earth and the species. And the earth is telling us now it's time to change. So how do we now create a story that fits the facts that we know and follows along in this storyline? That everything is perfect and everything will change.
You know, in the Upanishads, they say there are only three questions in the world. And we all answer these three questions at every moment of our lives. There are no other questions. So the three questions are, who are you? What is your relationship with the world? And why are you here? And if you think about it, we do answer these three questions at every moment. When we act, we are doing something after answering those three questions. So now we have to answer those three questions as a species. Who are we as a species? Who are we? What is our relationship with the earth? And why are we here as a species? Now I'm talking about who are we as a species, not in the spiritual sense. Uh, you know, if you ask an enlightened person, well, who are we as a species, he'll tell you, we are the universe. Each one of us is the universe. And it's true. Okay, because the separation of our skin is just an illusion. We are all connected. We are all connected, not only with each other, but to the entire world, the entire universe. In fact, I don't even know whether you see the universe the exact same way that I see it. Do you see green the same way I see green? I don't know. But that's very unhelpful for answering the question as to who, how do we fit in to ecosystems. We are a very unique species who has spread out throughout the world. So we must have something that makes us fit into every possible ecosystem around the world. So you have to ask, what are we biologically? What are we, who are we biologically? We are a very ordinary species, right? We don't run so fast. I mean, the tiger runs twice as fast as we do. We don't hear too well. We don't smell too well. We don't see too well. We don't even climb trees too well. And yet, we are the dominant species on Earth. So what made us so dominant? What made us so dominant is the fact that we are the best tool builders on the planet. No other species can compete with us when it comes to building tools. So that's one important characteristic that we have as a species. Yeah. Superlative tool builders. So there must be something that the Earth needs a great tool builder for. So she created us. So we have to understand what that something is. How do we fit into this ecosystem, into all ecosystems? And secondly, we have something that no other species has. We have the capacity to empathize with every bit of suffering. It doesn't matter if a child is pulling you know, if the child sees a leg of an insect come off, she will feel. She will feel that insect suffering. We have a unique capacity for compassion. Other species have capacity for compassion, but towards their own, mostly. It's very hard to see this kind of compassion that we have in any other species. So that's unique among us. But the opposite is also true. We can be cruel to every species. We can actually hide that compassion and become cruel to it. And we have it in that face. So I like to use an analogy. Right? So the analogy is of the caterpillar and the butterfly. It's actually in the first chapter of my book. See, the caterpillar, when the caterpillar is first born, he comes out of the egg. Then he eats the shell of the egg, it came out. Then he eats the leaf that the egg was on. And then he eats every bit of green that he sees for the next two to three weeks. He's a voracious consumer. It looks like the caterpillar is just full of violence towards biomasses, towards life. And then the caterpillar stops. It's 
spins a cocoon around himself, hangs under a twig, and meditates for a week, and wakes up as a butterfly. And as a butterfly, the caterpillar undoes the damage he did as a caterpillar. The butterfly pollinates flowers, and as, as his and it's a very you know, it's a very discriminating consumer, right? Butterfly. She only sips nectar from flowers. That is specific flowers. So that as the butterfly hops from flower to flower, she's pollinating those flowers and creating the life again. So I believe that we are a species like that. We have gone through a caterpillar phase. We have gone through this voracious consumption of things. Where we really are, our footprint is 150% of the capacity of the planet right now. So we have exceeded the capacity of the planet. Right now. And we are about to enter our butterfly phase. So that's the good news because the signal we are getting is that it's time to wake up. And we can see the signal everywhere. No, you cannot continue this for another 20 years. It doesn't work. We are killing 50,000 elephants every year. For ivory. And there are only 500,000 elephants left in the world. So we know the numbers. So we know we are going to change. But is the change we are talking about just changing our food habits? I think if we just went vegan, the problem would be solved. I believe that that's just a symptom. Because you see, fundamentally, sustainability is not that complicated. We know how to live sustainably. Because kindness to all life is infinitely sustainable. We can be kind forever. part of creation is unsustainable. It's violence that makes us unsustainable. And we have a system that is completely built on violence. When we think about the violence that's committed to animals, that is just the bottom, the foundation of the violence structure that we have. You see the violence that we are committing to other human beings too. There is slave labor in China. There are kids plucking cocoa from trees for being. Now if you talk to the kids, they tell you, if you eat chocolate, you are literally eating meat. In God. So, there is violence up and down the chain. Because that is how we, we keep reducing costs. Because it is a capitalist system that is driving us. The violence in the Congo that began with slavery is still continuing. About six million people were killed in the last ten years in the Congo. And that's where all the minerals for our cell phones come from. So by keeping that violence going, we have made sure that we have a cheap source for tantalum capacitors. So even if other countries are mining tantalum, they have to compete with Congo. Because Congo has 60% of the life. So we have this violence up and down the chain of our hierarchical system. And ultimately, it's driven by the uh, money supply being controlled by a few people. And they are scared. So this entire system is built out of fear. And the only way we can, we can begin to address this is to understand why we built this. Why did we build all this? And how do we build an alternate system in parallel so that we can transition to that? This is our job. This is our job in the transformative phase, moving from the caterpillar to the butterfly. 
So to understand, you know, why are we here, we have to really tell the Earth's story first. It isn't just a human story, it's human story within the Earth's story. So what is the Earth's story? Why does she need a species like us at this point in time? We all know that we have we have been uh, we have been changing a lot of the carbon cycle, the cycles, geophysical cycles around the planet. Right? So we have been changing the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the water cycle, land. You name it, we have affected it as human beings. So in totality, we have to look at what we have done and and see. What has happened to the cycle in nature over time? And why does she need these changes to happen as the, as the, uh, as the Earth? So the Earth was born 4.6 billion years ago, along with the Sun. So the Earth and all the planets came out of the same accretion disk. This is why all the planets are in the same plane from the Sun. And when the Earth was first formed, she was perfectly in the middle of what is known as the habitable zone around the sun. The habitable zone is the zone around a star where water is present as liquid on the surface. If you go to Venus, it's too hot, so the water is up in the air and it's gone, okay, it disappears. So the atmosphere becomes just CO2. And Venus has a surface temperature of 470 degrees Fahrenheit. On Mars, it's too cold. So we are like the Goldilocks plane, right? So we are in the Goldilocks zone around the sun. But over time, the sun gets hotter and hotter. And that's what has happened. So over the past 4.6 billion years, the sun has really become 40% hotter than, than it used to be. And as the star gets hotter, this is a very normal process, okay? So that as the star gets hotter, the habitable zone moves out. So the Earth, which used to be right in the middle of the habitable zone, is now at the inner edge of the habitable zone. Last year there was a paper that showed that the, uh, the habitable zone around the Sun is now from 0.99 AU to 1.67 AU. The AU is the astronomical unit. So meaning we are just 1% away from the inner edge of the habitable zone. This is why the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere of the Earth used to be anywhere from 5,000 to 20,000 parts per million, uh, 250 million years ago. And now it's at what? 400 parts per million? And we think that's too much. That it needs to be at 350 parts per million or less. And it's true because you see, over the past 3 million years, if you look at the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, they have been oscillating between 180 and 280 parts per million. It's a very thin veneer of, of greenhouse gases that's keeping life on Earth sustained. And because it's such a thin veneer, it's very sensitive. If there is a volcanic eruption like what happened 500 million years ago, you'd be gone. So the volcanic eruptions in the Siberian traps is estimated to have put out like 2,000 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere. But if there is a, an asteroid hit, like what happened 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs died, all life will disappear. It's not just extinction of just the dinosaurs. All life will probably disappear because it's that sensitive now. So what would the Earth do? in a situation where she is so sensitive. And all of our biogeophysical processes are not fast enough to respond to any threats. What would she do? She would create a species that can actually build atomic bombs, put them on spaceships and rockets, send them up there and blow the asteroid away. And that's who we are. We are capable of doing that. We have absolutely can. In fact, Ten years ago, I think 2003, there was a uh, news article that came out saying that there is an asteroid that's going to hit us in 2016. 
but they had made the calculations after only 51 observations. And after further observations, they said, oh, it's, it's not going to happen. Okay. So everybody breathed a sigh of relief and went about bombing Iraq instead. If that happens, we won't be bombing Iraq. You would have bigger problems to, to deal with, right? So we would be focused as a species to deal with the asteroid threat. So we are the fine-tuned feedback that the planet needs when she's in such a sensitive phase. So that she can survive in life for another billion years. At some point, the sun is going to get too hard for life to, to survive on Earth. Unless our descendants figure out how to put mirrors and you know and make the sun disappear, make the sun get cooler, right? Which could happen, who knows? So that's the why are we here? Why are we here? So so now that we know why we are here, or it's a plausible story. It's again everything is a story, okay? Because everything in nature is unique. And uh, nature is so complex that we make up stories to tell ourselves, to tell each other, so that we make sense of reality. And this is a story that falls along the storyline that everything is perfect, everything is fine as is, and everything will change. Because we now know our responsibilities, and we now know what we are, our responsibilities to each other as well. So if you think about the history, of human beings. You know, 100 years ago, Gandhi said, we have to become non-violent in order to survive on Earth. And he really tried. He tried to get people to become non-violent. He succeeded in getting the British out of India. But he didn't succeed in his Gandhian revolution. Because as soon as India got independence, Gandhi got assassinated within a year, and India became an industrial power again. Okay, followed the West. So that was the first Malthusian deadline we had. See, when, when food was going to become scarce, and people were worried about it. But we invented fertilizers, and we said we don't need this non-violence. Let's go back to our violent phase. In the 60s, Martin Luther King did the same thing. He tried to create a non-violent movement for equality. And even if he got assassinated, and the Green Revolution came along and it supposedly created more food for us to eat. So now we have another situation exactly like that, where food is the central issue. This is why the vegan revolution is part of this transformation that's going to happen. Because we know that we cannot, we cannot eat like we did before. If everybody in, on earth ate like an American, the planet is finished. And we know that. But it isn't just eating. It's all consumption. There is a gentleman in India from Mukesh Ambani, who built a, a $1 billion home in the middle of Mumbai. 27 stories tall, and every story is furnished with different motifs. So he can go to Italy, from Italy to Greece, just by walking down the stairs. And he boasts that he never sets foot on the ground. Because he gets to the roof of his house, gets on a helicopter, and goes to the roof of his office, goes down to his office. And from the 27 story building, he can actually see the slums of Mumbai. So if everybody aspired to have houses like Mr. Ambani, how many people can the planet support? The total wealth of the planet is $200 trillion. So which means we can build 200,000 such homes. And we're done. The planet is finished. And this billion dollar home is for just five people. So 200,000 families with five people each 
That's a million people that Bannock can support <coughs> at that level of consumption. So you can see that we have to we have to really put some kind of limits on our consumption overall. And we have to have a mechanism for doing that. Right now we don't have a mechanism for that. Right now we have a mechanism that says consumption is great. More consumption is better. And consumption has been tied to happiness. So we have to have a parallel system that we have to build now where we set limits, total lim a limit on the total amount of footprint we can have on Earth. And figure out how we are going to work around, work within that constraint. And we have the tools to do that too. So the internet is the great level. When we design the internet, I'm, a, I'm an engineer by the way. I'm an electrical systems engineer. Uh, in 96, uh, I was working on the standards for the internet. And when I was working on the standards for the internet, we thought the internet was, we didn't know whether it was going to go anywhere. We know the techies were using it. We were sending emails to each other and so on. But our emails, we had to use a modem that would dial up, collect our emails once in a while. And we were building these faster and faster communication systems so that we can kind of make this more seamless. And in 96, uh, I was asked as a systems guy, because I'm a systems guy, and so the chairman of the committee asked me, you know, we are having trouble with getting 100 megabit to work. And can you take a look at the protocol and tell us what we need to do differently? 100 megabit Ethernet is it. Transmits at 100 megabits per second over 100 meters of wire. Okay, that's all it does. So I looked at the standard and I uh, and I realized that the cable itself was capable of handling 10 times as much. We could easily do one gigabit per second, but the protocol was messed up. Right? So I wrote a proposal that we should actually do a gigabit, and then when that gigabit falls back to 100, it will be robust. Let's do the gigabit correctly. And everybody laughed at the meeting. They said, you're out of your mind. Because you know, how can you make things go 10 times faster?
So I don't think Bitcoin is the technology, but Bitcoin is showing us a way to get there. Showing us how to create a distributed ledger, a distributed uh, control system for our finances and our, economic, and our economics, where you don't need banks, you don't need lawyers, you don't need patents, you don't need any of this stuff. You can do this thing distributed fashion and, um, and make it a much more just world for all of us to live in. The people don't feel left out. And you're allowed to then basically be free and do what you are good at. Not be forced into doing something. Because you see, ultimately, violence is a violation of consent. So if you're working in a job that you don't like, that's also violence. You should be free to do what you want. And that's the kind of live life the elephant lives in the forest. That's the kind of live life that we all are entitled to. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions. Please ask me whatever you think. Uh, you know, whatever you want to try to do. Uh, what can we do to stop human extinction? Yeah. The first thing you have to uh, believe is that there isn't going to be a, that there, there is not going to be a human extinction. We are going to lick this. We are going to solve this problem. Okay. So the first thing you need to do is get together with your community. Figure out how you're going to live with the smallest footprint possible. So you lower your consumption patterns. And trust that things are going to work out. It will work out. How does one make a contribution to making things better? Like I try, I would prefer to ride my bicycle. Right. I go into town every day, it's only two miles, I can ride a bike back. But I can't buy any tires that aren't made in China or Indonesia or Taiwan or something. I want to buy American-made products to make jobs for people here. I can't find it. How do I solve problems like that? Yeah, there, there are, you know, local... Um, we are now stuck in a system that's global. There's nothing yeah. you can do about it. You feel kind of like you're between a rock and a hard place. Right. You want to do something, but you're not given the wherewithal to do it. Right. And like, I know that the um, automotive industry shut down the cable cars, that sort of stuff. So public transportation is ridiculous. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like you want to do something, but you, the general world puts it against you. Right. So, I mean, Buckminster Fuller actually had a really nice quote. He said, if you want to change things, don't do it by fighting the existing reality. Do it by building a new model that makes the old model obsolete. So we have to vision a new model and work on that. You know, by the same token, I do have to say that there was a period of time that I went through. I've been a vegetarian for like 30 years. That I thought, oh my God, the world's going in the handbasket. And now I work with a woman who was doing vegan, um, plant-based diets at Kaiser Hospital. Right. I'm going, whoa, I can't believe that. Right. So I know the change does come eventually if I just live long enough. Right. <laughs> So, just, I mean, it's just to about a big point, but I feel like in, a, in any kind of capitalist society, like, you, theoretically humans could create some kind of utopia if they were, like, self-restricting. But there's a lot, like, you know, you could say, take 50 people, one person that wants more than everyone is going to screw up everything. Um, so how, like, without regulation, like, okay, iPhone 6, right, the world goes crazy, then there's an iPhone 6S, then there's an iPhone 7. Every single year, do you need to upgrade it? Absolutely not. Um, so like, um, without some type of like a communist almost like mandate or regulation saying, okay, the engineers will work on this for 10 years and then in 10 years it'll be so much more advanced that then you can buy a new one. You have to wait 10 years so we're not producing a bunch of crap year after year after year. Like, but that's, people aren't interested in that. And that's our entire 
society, capitalism isn't interested in that at all. They all just want you to buy as much. I mean, in fact, they've got designs for the next 10 years, and they're going to release one slowly year after year. You know, so that you have to buy it again. So I mean, it just seems like kind of like you're fighting a really uphill battle. Yeah. Um, I mean, like all the, and you're saying like we should be able to be like elephants and. I mean, what percentage of people do you really think do a job that they are fulfilled and love doing? I mean, it's not a very high percent. There's a few people that are super lucky that they have that, but there's a ton of jobs out there that people are just not really enjoying that they have to do. And it's all part of a huge system of people that are at the top that don't want to have to put in their share and, and train themselves and want a lot of money. You know? So like, I mean, I feel like it's going to take some kind of global cataclysm, you know, a huge amount of genocide or you know, my vast migrations of populations for people to wake up out of this like consumerist like uh, cycle. Yeah, uh, let's see. That's that's the story you've told yourself, right? So, but if you look at it, you can convince yourself that's true because you look at you're looking at the top half, the top maybe ten percent of the pyramid. Even smaller. Yeah. Smaller than the pyramid, yeah. right? If you look at the vast majority underneath, they're barely eking out a living in right. the current system, and. And they are finding actually their jobs are disappearing also because they're putting more and more robots into play. Right. And if you read a book, there's a book that Gandhi wrote in 1908 called Hind Swaraj. It's translated into English and it's available as PDF for free on the internet. If you read that, he'll tell you that the Indian civilization of the 20th century, early 20th century, we call it a steady state civilization where Indians had not even improved the plot for a thousand years because they said that design is good enough, it works. Okay. Because Indians had stopped worrying about material progress. They were more concerned about spiritual progress. So he called that a steady state civilization. And that was a steady state civilization with about 370 million people at that time. But it got subsumed by the Western civilization. The Western civilization came along with better weapons. When they are constantly doing material progress, they do build better weapons. Right? So now we have a global Western civilization. And now this global civilization has to reach that steady state. What are you talking about? Which is to say that we are done with the iPhone. Let's build an iPhone that lasts for 20 years. Okay? Not put a battery in there that you cannot change. Right? So redesign it so that it lasts. So it is, this is the steady state no version. No, no, there is no money in that right now, okay? In, in the current system. Because the current system is built like a pyramid. It's a pyramid scheme. So you have to now create an alternate currency. Right now, there are lots of local alternate currencies. So you have to create an alternate currency where everybody gets an equal say in what needs to get done. Everybody becomes their own capitalist. And they choose what this currency is going to be used towards. And that currency has to be tied to the footprint on the earth. So that there is a limit to what we can do on the earth. My question is, who enforces that? Is there something no, that the individual it, has to decide? Oh, and, and a lot of people aren't interested in doing that. Right, but yeah. you know who are interested in doing that? The poor people are. Because right now they are completely disempowered. If you go tell them, I'm going to give you free this currency, Maybe at, right now you can only get vegetables in your local grocery with this currency. Okay? But eventually you're going to have power over everything. You are going to be just as equal as anybody else. They'll sign on. They'll sign on today. So if you can get a majority of our cust the consumers of this thing sign on to this, corporations are going to come there. And they're going to ask what are the rules here. And they're going to follow that. So we have to create this alternate model that's attractive for a majority of people. And it is easy to do that because the majority of people are disempowered right now. It's so easy. So this is why I'm saying it is going to happen. Okay? The technology is there. And the vision is there. So we just have to make it happen. So have faith. Yeah, we have companies like Monsanto which are making, you know, destroying the seeds so that they, the poor people have to go and buy from that company year after year just to eat. No, no, you have to buy year after year the GMO seeds. Yeah. Yeah. But, the, but there are plenty of other seeds. There are seed banks all over the place now, okay? So they cannot possibly take away all the seeds. It doesn't happen. There are, there's a kid in uh, Phoenix. 
Phoenix, by the way, is the most unsustainable city in America. So you could you would think that this is where everybody would abandon Phoenix and run away. But there is a 25-year-old kid. His business is to go collect food waste from around Phoenix. And people pay him five dollars a week to come and collect their food waste. And he comes and builds the soil in central Phoenix, in the poorest part of the city, where I think land is easy, it's cheap. Land is very cheap, but the people are desperate. So he's building the soil there, and he's creating vegetables and fruit trees and all kinds of things. He's greening Phoenix from the center up. And you look at a project like that and you say, you know, how can you not have hope? Because now we are going to have a weekly, uh, weekly community dinner for the poor people to come and taste what real food tastes like. Because so far they've been eating, eating out of cans. They eat, eat whatever they get from food stamps. With this kind of a system, would, would that address like overpopulation as well? Well, why? So we have to ask why is the population increasing? And I ask that question, okay? Because you look at the statistics of the, I, I take India as an example because I go there quite often. And in India, when I was born in 1960, um, the life expectancy in India was 36. And uh, my parents expected kids to die. My grandmother, I remember my grandmother telling my mother, don't ever get attached to the child until he's a year old. This was my younger brother she was talking about. And I overheard that because I was four years old at that time. Because she expected that child to die. But a lot of us survived. Because we all had vaccines. You know? So my parents had five kids. So they had seven kids and two died. So they had five kids. So this, and when India got independence in 1947, the life expectancy in the UK was 64. <coughs> and the average woman used to have 2.7 uh, children in, in the UK. What was that? 2.7 children, the average woman. Now, in India, the life expectancy is 65. And the average woman has 2.68 kids. So India has reached the same level as the UK was in 1947, when India got independence. But it took 60 odd years for that to happen. But even in India now, there is a big divide between the urban and the, and the rural. If you go to the rural areas and you ask, why do you have six kids? There are six kids in each family. And she says, I don't know how many will survive. I don't know how, how many will survive to take care of us. See, this it is fear that drives the population increase. If you give people the security that their child will be alive, why would they have more than two kids? Maybe even more than one kid. If you look at the urban Indians now, you know, they only have one or two kids. In France, the government actually is giving incentives to French women to have more kids. And he asks, what's wrong with this picture? Isn't there a population problem? Why don't you just go adopt if you need more kids? There are plenty of kids who are orphaned in Africa and India and China and places like that. Right? So, so we have this divide. And when you give people the security that they will be, that they're fine, that they're, they're okay, <coughs> They don't have too many kids. So when you give them the health care that they need, you have to empower the women so that they have control over their own. And they don't have more kids. So population is really our own system creating the population increase. Because we need it, we need cheap labor at the bottom to drive this growth in the economy. So how do you get cheap labor? So make sure you destroy all the forests so they cannot live there. Yeah, my jobs. And then they have to come to the slums and work. So we ask, you know, I mean, people will tell you that cell phones are now everywhere in India. It's true. There are cell phones in villages. Remote villages have cell phones. And you ask, why did they have cell phones? How did they get the cell phones? People gave them cell phones for free. 
who gave them the cell phones? It's the, the brokers, the contractors in the city who gave them the cell phones for free. Because they can call them and say, there is a bricklaying job, come over to the city, because this guy in the village works for half the price of the guy in the, in the city. So it's a way to drive down labor costs. So when we look at the whole system and you analyze what's going on, you begin to understand why it is the way it is. And when we understand why it is the way it is, we now understand how to build something in parallel. I'm not asking to just dismantle this whole thing. I'm saying, let's build something in parallel that people want to be part of that. In parallel. They'll join that to be in parallel. Initially, it may not be too lucrative for people, but they will join. And there you have to make it so that if people accumulate, they're actually doing good. Imagine that. If your dollar is tied to a footprint on the earth, if you accumulate more dollars, you're actually reducing the footprint on earth. Thank you very much for doing that. So it's not that we don't know how to do this. You know? We can create a system which does drive us to do the right thing. But then I say, we did what we did because without this, we couldn't have built the tools we have. Imagine if the world was full of Buddhas. Everybody was enlightened. Do you expect a Buddha to go build an atom bomb? For what? Do you expect a Buddha to want to go to the moon? Why? None of those things would have happened. But without that technology, how are you going to destroy an asteroid? Have you seen the movie Deep Impact or whatever? Yeah. Or Armageddon. Yeah. Yeah. Right, same, same thing. So there they show what needs to get done. You know? and, and I think now we have the technology. We have built it. But we built it in the process of competing with the Soviets. The Soviets competing with the Americans. We built it for military purposes. But we have it now. So now we can transition over. So we are done with our tool building phase, and so now we can transition over to our compassionate phase. That's a great story. I mean, I'm sticking with it, okay? That's my story. <laughs>
See, when we were doing the internet, we had a debate between two technologies. The first technology was proposed by telephone companies called ATM. And that technology, in order to send a message from one computer to another, you had to go send a message to a central server and ask them how to route it. And if that technology had won, the internet would not be the way it is now. It would have been centralized. And we would have been in big trouble. But we created a peer-to-peer -peer network, a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, where anybody can plug in and say, I'm sending, and send directly to the nearest guy, and he will figure out how to send it to So we have the capacity now and the technology to build a peer-to-peer -peer network of us, for us. So literally, the internet is like the nervous system for the planet. And we are the nerve cells, the age of the nervous system. Okay, excuse me. Can you talk a little bit more about the Bitcoin that happened with it? So Bitcoin, so the origin of Bitcoin is the 2007 financial crisis. So when the financial crisis happened and the banks got bailed out, somebody got mad. Some software kid got mad. So, and from all we know of him, looks like it's a him, first of all. And from all we know of him, he, uh, he is from the UK. He calls himself Satoshi Nakamoto, which obviously is a, is a pseudonym. So nobody knows who he is. So he put, a, he put together this protocol that eliminates banks. You don't need banks anymore. But you can do banking, you can do transactions, mm -hmm. and it's secure. Mm -hmm. He made it secure, and he made it so that the ledger is robust. Mm -hmm. So you don't need a central ledger, because that's all the banks do, right? They have a central accounting system. So you cannot go withdraw money from one ATM and run and withdraw the same money from another ATM. So he did that, and he released it for free. He said it's open source, the software is available for free, and the technology is available for free. And over time, people started investing in it. They bought computers to drive, you know, to use, to use it as servers. So now the Bitcoin uh, market is worth like $12 billion. Wow, so it's been a whole cycle. I mean, seven, I'm looking at it. seven, four, so it's been a whole cycle. Right, yeah, so it's been about five, six years of Bitcoin. It's been out. Right. You said it's secure. Aren't there several computers that are to the internet that have been hacked? Now, what got hacked were the private keys of people. So, so the way Bitcoin works is that everybody you know, has a private key and, uh, and then they have a public key. So the transactions are still valid. It's just that whoever had the money, the private key, they, it disappeared. So somebody else took it. So if you don't know what your private key is, you can go and retrieve that. So is that like a minimum risk? Is that like the risk is, I mean, the individual has a risk. You know, if you, oh, yeah. if you leave your wallet out there and walk away and you say, come back and he says, money mm -hmm. is gone. Yeah. I mean, in terms of this concept, that would right. be what you talked about the privacy. No, side. the protocol really didn't get broken. The protocol is rock solid, as far as we know. So far, it's been rock solid. <laughs> right, so, so he showed how to do, how to do it in the banks. Mm -hmm. right. So I can just Google it. Right. Thank you. The only problem with Bitcoin is it's still a currency. Right. And it loses the value. Right. And um, mm -hmm. there's only one thing that is not, which is gold and silver, basically. Well, and the earth. So that's what I'm saying. You need to have you need to have something that's pegged to something real. So uh, I'm suggesting that the currency should be pegged to one square meter of biological capacity of the Earth. Mm. And if you say that so for one year, right? So whatever the capacity is for one year, if you peg your currency to that, then you know that the total amount of circulation of the currency is restricted by what you can do on Earth. Yes, so the, the true wealth is the fertile land. That is the true wealth of the plant. Right. But if, is the if we could pay something to it, yeah, maybe it could work, but uh, it's a problem to make, to make that system happen, I guess. Right. 
it's a, it's, so the design problem is to think up a system that's distributed, that there's no central authority, it's free running, and it is spent to, to real productivity of the earth. That's how you can create a sustainable system. And it should be, it should be fair, equal and fair. Also, probably it should fine or punish where destroy land and makes it unfair. Or right. So that's part or of the pollutes it right. or emits right. poisonous things to the air or whatever. So it should go both ways. So the capacity will get, I mean, get removed from that person. So everybody becomes a source of currency. Then, you know? And if we do something to improve the productivity of the earth, the value increases. So it's fun though. You know, think of a system like that and have it out there and open source it and build it up and see what happens. Are you familiar with the Venus project? The Venus project? Yeah, no, I'm not. They have this grand idea of uh, resource-based economy, of what you described earlier. And basically all the products will be uh, manufactured in every, whatever amounts they are needed for everybody to share, like a grand library. So you're not going to have your own car, you're not going to have your own guitar. You're just going to borrow them as long as you need them to. And then you can create products that last for a long time. Right and only the amounts needed for everybody to right. use. And no money society and robotic uh, manufacturing and everything, a lot of the things you mentioned. Uh,